Okay, so it's not only about uh, just doing angiograms and uh, left-sided stuff. Um, so, of course, we'd have to come away and do the right heart, too, that way, because we wouldn't want to go down the groin just because the excuse was, well, I needed to get, you know, cardiac output or do an aortic stenosis case. So you can do a total aortic stenosis case from the arm, too, uh, with the six-wrench you know, uh, catheter and the uh, dual limit pigtail catheter and so forth. So um, at any rate, uh, how to do the right heart is always, uh, people, you know, there are some issues that you do need to be aware of in terms of how, how to go about doing that. So, um, I, again, we learned a lot from Ian Gilchrist when he came out here, uh, sort of one of our first uh, 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 keynote speakers, and uh, uh, in terms of how to go about kind of doing right heart stuff, and uh, it, a lot of this I have to give, this to, uh, to give his benefit to him about that. Um, at any rate, so, um, so you can do this from the wrist, although most people would probably, uh, I'll, I'll talk about where we kind of more recently have been doing um, the access for the uh, right heart uh, uh, procedures. The venous anatomy, uh, again, there's an incredible amount of variability in the forearm. So really to even try to describe you know, or give names to anything that's going to be there and expect it to be there is, is sort of, uh, you know, hoping, uh, hoping for the best. But in general, uh, once you sort of get up to the elbow and then into the, uh, into the upper arm, uh, the key thing is obviously there's the antecubital vein. Uh, but uh, there's the basilic vein and the cephalic vein. And where you want to ideally be is over in the basilic vein uh, and because it's a much easier shot to deliver equipment and there's not as much tortuosity. So by virtue of that, you're going to sort of want to be on the medial side of the arm. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute here as to you know, how to go about planning all that. So uh, one of the other key things about the, uh, uh, the veins is that they're very dispense distensible compared to the arteries. Uh, and they're always bigger. And so you know, people say, geez, you're going to take a seven French sheath and put it in that you know, vein, that in the antecubital vein. And the answer is, of course, we were going to put a six French sheath in the brake bill. I mean, it ought to be able to handle like an eight or a nine, frankly. So, um, so that's, the, that's one thing just to sort of remember. But you don't want to break the veins. So uh, particularly the, the great veins, that's, uh, that's something you, is you don't want to get into. But they can handle relatively large sheaths as long as you're careful with what you're doing. Um, it is a lower pressure system, obviously. Uh, there is venous spasm. Venous spasm usually responds to nitroglycerin rather than calcium channel blockers, unlike the arteries, which are much better uh, to respond to calcium channel blockers. So many of us have sort of moved away from nitroglycerin as a routine part of the arterial cocktail and using some sort of a calcium channel blocker. Uh, and then for the veins, using nitroglycerin to dilate the veins. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, if you warm up the hand, obviously, or warm up the area there, it'll make the veins dilate. And so that's another thing just to consider. Um, so again, uh, here's sort of the typical patterns that usually, uh, if you're out in the, the down nor the wrist, if you're on the medial side of the arm, you're more likely going to shoot up the basilic vein. You can sometimes get there from over on the radial side, too. And this sort of gets into, you know, where is your, uh, your venous axis really going to be? So if you have the preference, you sort of want to be in the medial side of the arm if you can do it. Um, the upper venous anatomy uh, is also is a very important th thing to recognize. So the first, the, the criti most critical thing is that there's something called the T junction right here at the uh, um, at the, where the cephalic vein enters, enters into the, and becomes the axillary vein. And this is a 90 degree angle more often than not, and that's important to remember because if you're trying to deliver the equipment up here and you're in the cephalic side, you may frequently bang into that. And sometimes you can't help where you're going to be. Uh, and so it's just sort of be aware of that. And that key, the, the take home point there again is when you advance things and it stops, there's oftentimes a reason why. And this will happen if you start doing a lot of this. You're going to be in the cephalic vein. You can deal with it. You just sort of need to know what to do. But the key thing is uh, not to be too aggressive at this point because if you, if you actually rupture this vein, now that's a big trouble. Uh, and you don't want to be there if you, don't, if you don't have to be. So again, just be careful with advancing equipment and not pushing it real hard. Um, let's see. So one of the things we talked about is how do we get around to getting the access? Since we're physicians, unless you happen to be an anesthesiologist, most of us are not so great at IVs anymore. And uh, so the people who are good at IVs are usually the nurses or the IV team, most importantly. And actually, there's no reason why you can't use a perfectly good IV to get started with your venous access. So the deal we typically strike up is that we're going to have the IV team put in a second IV, usually in the antecubital space, on um, whichever arm you're going to go on. Okay. Uh, and so I, when I do the right heart cases, usually if I'm doing an aortic stenosis case and I just want to do a workup for a valve, I'll do the wrist for right wrist for the to do the cores, and then do the right antecubital for uh, doing the right heart, 
and at the end you're done, you can do the whole case from the arm. Um, that's sort of nice because those patients often as they're old and frail and they really didn't want and frankly get an invasive vagal reaction and an AS case is not what you had in mind. Um, so <coughs> the, uh, the deal is basically you put in an IV and then you can hip lock the IV uh, and obviously it saves time with you having to fool around the cath lab trying to get start an IV down in the lab, okay? So uh, that's sort of where our protocol set up. Now there's a couple ways you can kind of go about doing this. Um, the one way is just simply to put the heplock on the IV, scrub it off, and then take your access needle and put it into the heplock and put the wire through it into the access needle. Then you remove the access needle and the heplock simultaneously. You're left with a wire that's hanging out from underneath the skin, okay? Uh, and then, then you're ready to go. Um, so I've gone away from even cutting the skin anymore. I just use a, a glide. Uh, catheter now to put into the to the vein. There's several ways of doing it. If you like the want to do thermal dilution, there's no reason why you can't use a seven French sheath. Um, and uh, uh, in that case, you probably will need a skin nick. Obviously, you don't want to cut so deep that you get down into the vein itself because repairing the vein is not what you have in mind. What you're really trying to just just like with the groin is free up enough tissue there that you can actually deliver the sheath. Um, so. And uh, so here's sort of what that sort of looks like. Here's that cook needle. Um, now, there's no reason why if you're doing something else that you can't, you can't do this another way. Other ways of doing this are just to take the cap off it. You've got to make sure that the cap's prepped. If you do that, you're probably better off just changing your gloves after you're done doing that. Um, but, uh, but you can do it this way, too. And then you wind up taking this out and leaving, taking the, 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 the wire. The, excuse me. Once you access this, put the wire through the access needle, through the half block, through the IV, and into the vein. Uh, then you can kind of pull all this out, uh, pull the uh, the IV, the hep block, and the needle out, and you're left with the wire sort of hanging out of the arm. Okay. Um, so, a couple things to think about if you want to do this in the room yourself, there are a couple things to do. This one, warm up the room because most of us keep the cat lab really cold, mostly because there's so much electronic equipment in there, and that obviously leads to the veins being constricted. So. If you warm up the, the air in the room, then the veins will dilate. It'll make it easier for you to get an IV in. Um, the other thing is uh, use the ultrasound. So you saw me doing the sonocyte there. You can use the ultrasound as well uh, to find the vein. Uh, the key thing about veins is, as you saw me kind of pushing up and down with the sonocyte, one of the things that happens is the artery will not compress. It'll sort of, it'll sort of move like that. You'll still see it pulsating, and a vein will just crump, crump, crump down uh, when you push on it. So. Unless the patient's got a you know extremely high venous pressure, but if they got that high venous pressure, you're probably going to be able to get the vein. Um, so, uh, but at any rate, it, it should just basically compress and uh, and and squish down. So there you can sort of see. Okay, this is one of Mauricio's pictures actually at one point in the past. So <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so um, if it's sheath, if it, you get a little less worried about the sheath on the venous side than you do on the arterial side. And many of you have seen the nurses when they'll sort of hook up IVs and run a bunch of air into the IV, not a whole lot, but I mean, they'll be in the air in the IV line, and they just run it through anyway, and it all goes to the venous system, the lungs filter it out. So you need to get as quite worked up about the sheath as you do on an arterial side of things. And so it may be that you may not get any blood back when you aspirate the sheath. That's okay, um, but you know, obviously you don't want to force things, but it doesn't mean you still can't proceed on with still trying to get an advanced equipment through the sheath. Okay. Um, I like, uh, there's a, a wedge catheter, it's a uh, six wrench wedge catheter, I think works beautifully. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, I swear by it now, and I don't, it doesn't allow you to do thermal dilution, but if you do fix, and this thing just frankly, in my opinion, flies out into the pulmonary artery from the arm. It's, uh, um, so I, I swear by it now for using it. Um, Arrow makes a five French system too that you can use. Um, you may want to sort of figure out what's on, on uh, around on your uh, hospital's equipment list. A lot of stuff is sometimes pediatric-based equipment, but you're going from the arm, so it's oftentimes long enough that you can use it. Um, but uh, uh, I, these, these catheters, I think um, um, this approach has worked really well for me for most cases to, to try to get most of the access done. Um, the other thing is that the IV doesn't necessarily have to be in the antecubital space. I did a case yesterday where the IV was down here in the medial aspect of the arm. It was a relatively short patient, so it wasn't really a big deal. Um, and we were still able to put a six French sheath into the vein down here in the forearm in a five foot two person and still able to do the whole right heart cast. So uh, it wasn't, uh, there was no real resistance to anything there. So um, again, I wouldn't shy away from, from uh, uh, putting IVs in, in the arm and, and making an effort to try to use the veins to try to, to, to get your right heart cath done. Um, let's see, to the venous system. One of the critical issues is, 
again, that T-junction where the cephalic vein comes in. So one of the, 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 one of the critical rules, and there aren't that, that many critical rules in radial, angel, uh, radial catheterization, but do not blow up the balloon on the right heart catheterization until you are in a central venous structure, meaning the axillary subclavian vein or further down. And that can be, you can be fooled by that. So just using the clavicle as your reference, I've learned that's sort of the bad idea. You want to get well beyond the clavicle before you start blowing the balloon. If you can't get the catheter to advance beyond that, it's not, it doesn't mean you should stop. What you should do is you can inject some dye through the catheter and see what's going on with the venous anatomy. There's also no reason why you can't take a glide wire and put it through uh, through a, a catheter or pull out the right heart catheter and put up a Juggins 4 catheter and then manipulate that through the venous system and then get the wire out into the central vein. Once you've done that, and you should use a glide wire to do that, then you can advance a catheter in, take it out, uh, you know, take out another catheter and advance your uh, right heart catheter over that. That'll work just fine. So there's no, again, this is just troubleshooting how you kind of get through things. Um, so uh, that's what I've sort of found as a, as a useful way to kind of get around uh, doing things. The, um, the, the biggest issues of what side to use, um, people who have had really dramatic operations to their shoulders, oftentimes the venous anatomy will be messed up. And so uh, if you have the luxury of kind of knowing that in the history, you may want to pick the other arm. Uh, people have talked about mastectomies. Actually, Ian Gilchrist did a, put a, there's a letter in, JC, in CCI, I think, uh, recently about that about what should we even be doing right, and there's really no data that, that, that doing right heart radial angioplasty from the arm in a patient with a mastectomy has created any problems at all. In fact, if you were to pick an arm, which one you want to use, you probably ought to use the artery on the side, on the ipsilateral side by which the uh, mastectomy was done, because they're not mucking with the venous system. The, the issue always has been there is about lymphedema and, uh, and, and so forth. And, uh, the reality is that we're not in there very long. It's for indwelling catheters and things like that that people get worried about when there gets to be clot and things that potentially forming thrombus is going to be going on for days on end if the catheter is going to be in there and so forth. They always talk about blood pressure cuffs and things like that. And frankly, the reality is that I don't necessarily there's a hell of a lot of data that really supports that recommendation. So um, I, you know, I've moved away to not just say I, I don't consider a mastectomy a reason to turn a patient down from doing a right doing a radial procedure on them. So. I don't know, Marisa, what do you think about that? Uh, if I fire resistance? Yeah, no, for uh, mastectomies. For ma well, you got to do whatever the yeah. patient wants. Yeah. And, and patients usually are told not let anybody mess yeah. with that arm. Yeah. So I'll just, I don't think that there is any specific contraindication. I don't see the reason, but the surgeons are very, you know, they, they, yeah. they, tell, they instruct the patients. Right. And and then the patients feel very strongly about not having IVs, not having anything done in that arm, so just don't do it. Surgical door. Hmm? Surgical door. Yeah. I yeah, know. Um, so anyway, so I, yeah, again, there's, there's are some series of people doing things with mastectomies and not having any complications doing right heart cast. So, you know, the reality is that that uh, I think it's it's something that you can do um, as long as you're you know using good judgment and not you know uh, you know doing things that are that are. So, so, so one thing that you mentioned about using ultrasound. So a couple of things. So uh, the text, oh, the nurses can get an IV if the if the if the veins are visible and are nice. There's a new tool. There's uh, a new tool to get uh, ultrasound access in the holding area with uh, for for the vein. Uh -huh. Then if they cannot get it, you can call the IV team and they can put a small introducer sheet like that, the midline. They call it the midline. Because it's, that's the introducer sheet that comes with the micropuncture, and then you just swap it for your sheet. Mm -hmm. And then if uh, you couldn't get a hold of the IV team, which is usually the case because they're busy doing something else, you bring them in the cath lab, and you have to put a you have to put a tourniquet, like a rubber. You know, you can use just a rubber glove around the arm, and mm -hmm. that will that will allow you to visualize the, the veins much better. And you got to be very careful when you are puncturing the veins because uh, the vein is adjacent to the artery and also adjacent to the nerve. So those are the things that you need to, to, to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. But it's doable, and uh, I, use, I, I, I use the longer, the two-inch needle, not the one-inch, mm -hmm. but the longer needle, but the two-inch micropuncture needle. I mean, that's my practice. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's I my usually, system. I usually try to get the nurses to do it. <laughs> so, <No. laughs> um, but uh, anyway, um, OK. So uh, let's see. Here's a couple of examples of a venogram. Let's see. Um, you know, and then you can kind of see the uh, uh, there. 
you know, and there's the cephalic vein, and you can see um, the basilic vein and the cephalic vein. Obviously, this is a much bigger vein, which is sort of why you want to be down in it if you possibly can. Uh, and then there's the T-junction up there uh, where, where you're going to uh, put the vein joints, the, the uh, axillary. Uh, here, thanks, Ken. Here's, again, a catheter just manipulating through. And, um, you know, finish the time, so you'll just, sort of just watching what you're doing and sort of, you know, twerking on the catheter and watching it make progress. You can do that. Uh, you can get the catheter to go up the arm. Um, again, if don't push real hard and don't inflate the balloon. Uh, a deep breath also can be very helpful because it obviously it puts negative thoracic pressure on there and helps suck the vein, the blood back into the thoracic system uh, and may help suck the catheter in. I think the wire is probably the most helpful thing I've encountered. And the other thing I add on to this one is to add is to feel free to use a small Judkins catheter to get up there and help you manipulate the wire if the, if the right heart catheter isn't going. Um, and then uh, um, the when you finish up, um, typically you can just pull the sheath out. I usually wait till the end of the procedure. Um, but I don't, again, if they're fully anticoagulated, it's not a big deal. Uh, I usually take some Coban and, ra and a four by four and wrap it around the site and that takes care of it. Um, so that's not really a big issue. If the sheath is having resistance coming out, get some nitroglycerin, that usually will loosen it right on up and it should be able to come out without too much of a problem. And that's pretty much it for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, for the, for the sheath, for the venous sheath. Uh, venous obstructions, yeah. This is, depends on how much, you know, resilience you really want to put into doing this. And these are cases where I probably would say, yeah, there probably still is a role for right femoral vein access. Um, but, you know, some people have been able to get through these, these, uh, these collaterals. Uh, it depends on how much work you really want to put into it. Um, if you do a pacemakers, I don't know how many of you do that. Uh, but this is part of, it, part of doing pacemakers is understanding, you know, sometimes there are venous obstructions and you've got to figure out how to get into the collaterals to get the leads uh, through the collaterals or tunnel them through things. And, you know, um, again, I would say this sort of gets into how much you really want to do and how much of a zealot you want to be about from the arm. But uh, it can be done. Um, so, again, um, the uh, venous axis, again, is, the, is uh, um, usually from a some sort of a IV that's usually ideally placed by the nurses, but you know you can do it yourself, obviously. Uh, and then a uh, balloon tube catheter. You people have put described putting temporary pacing wires in or doing even biopsies from the arm. Uh, the biopsy thing may not be unreasonable. I think putting a temporary wire in if it's going to be in any for a long period of time is probably a bad idea. Uh, and leaving indwelling things in the arm is probably not such a good idea. That's a setup for a DVT. Um, so, uh, but for an in and out procedures, I think it's, it's quite reasonable for most of the stuff that we do in the cath lab. Um, and again, the issue to review about this, the, the turn from the, from the uh, cephalic vein into the axillary, uh, and just to be careful about, stay on the ulnar side that is the medial side of the arm, uh, because you're more likely to get into the basilic vein that way. Uh, and. Um, okay. The other thing is that if you understand how to do the right heart cath, that basically finishes things off. So you can do basically all your diagnostic stuff from the arm. And, uh, you know, it, it, many of the, the zealots will tell you, you know, not having to do a right heart cath is a poor excuse to have to go down to the groin. Uh, that's uh, in order to have to access the groin and create a femoral complication. So uh, this is a skill set that I think is worthwhile learning how to do. At the end of the day, I've had a few people also that are really sick in the ICU that you really don't want to lie flat. And every now and then you see somebody who's sort of on the verge of uh, uh, crumping and uh, you're trying to avoid having you know, badness happen and lying in the flat and so forth. These are the patients that come in that need to be on a wedge and things that you're trying to do a catheterization on. Uh, and having the ability to do, again, a right heart cath from the arm uh, is a useful thing to be able to do. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to have your arm in here. Mm -hmm.